I scoured the entire internet to find lost media that I will be showing to you today. So just to be clear, the stuff that you're seeing today has never been seen before by anybody unless you've, for whatever reason, looked this stuff up before. So here we go. So first up, we're looking at Mario NetQuest. So a little bit of the lore behind Mario NetQuest is that it was basically released in 1997 to promote the IBM AS400 computer system. And this was the first Nintendo in-browser game that has ever come out. There's not much information as to why the game was ultimately pulled off the internet, but luckily we have some clips that we can look at so that we can channel the 1997 browser game that was Mario NetQuest. All right, so here's the game, how to play. You use your mouse to move Mario around the room. You win points by clicking on coins and stars. So it's like a point and click. So just classic browser Mario. This was right before Mario 64. I mean, this is thrilling. I wish this actually existed. This would rival the likes of Club Penguin and Webkins. This would be one of the most important browser games in history. It's crazy to think that for as big of an IP that Mario is, there's still a ton of uncovered media out there, but at least we found Mario NetQuest. Sticking with the Mario theme, and next up we have Mario Takes America, which was a 1992 CD game that was pitched by Sigam, which is a Toronto-based developer. Basically, this was an educational game in which Mario would visit at various locations in the United States. There's actually a really good video on this by Lady Decade in which she goes over Mario Takes America, but these are some assets, some screenshots from the game that would have been. So you could see Mario with a backwards hat, which is kind of crazy, looking at the Hollywood sign. And then I guess he's in the swamps of Louisiana and then some caves maybe like in Maine. It was pitched to be an educational game in which he would just collect shine sprites. Now they created Mario Odyssey. He goes to New Donk City. So I guess in a way he ultimately came to America. I think he's more popular in America than Japan now anyway. I would think. All right, so next up we have Welcome to Pooh Corner, which was a live action Winnie the Pooh from 1983 for Disney Channel. There was for a long time, no traces of this on the internet. And then somebody ultimately uncovered basically every single episode. So let's have a quick look at this. This is about to be so uncanny. I hope this isn't creepy. It looks like it's gonna be creepy. Oh my gosh, that might be the creepiest thing I've ever seen. I don't love that owl. Let's see the big reveal for Pooh. Oh my gosh, just thinking there's a grown man in that rabbit costume. Okay, Piglet, kind of cute. Why does Winnie look so creepy? I think his collar is is too choked up. Looks like he's wearing a turtleneck. I think it's scary that they don't blink. Okay, I really shouldn't be watching this at night. That's Welcome to Pooh Corner. Hope you don't get nightmares from that. Sticking with the Mickey Mouse theme, and now we have a nine minute short film of Mickey Mouse, and it just shows him walking back and forth, and then you'll see what he does at the end. This was made, by the way, by two Disney workers, and then upon Walt Disney seeing it, he fired them because of how graphic and terrible it was. So I think they were just playing around. This thing somehow surfaced. Somebody recovered this a couple of years ago. Now we have it. It's honestly a little bit disturbing, so you've been warned. So it starts off with some eerie music and Mickey Mouse is just walking down the street. Now there's just a black screen, but this doesn't last for long because now Mickey resurfaces continues walking down this path. So you can tell how eerie this is. All right, there's some tickering in the background, some noises. Sounds like some moans and growls. Okay, now focus on Mickey right here. You'll see he begins smiling, almost maniacal. Something's happening to our friend here. All right, now Mickey is smiling even more. Just a big old grin here. Keeps pacing. So his frown is turned upside down. I guess that's a positive. Though I don't think this is the best smile that one could have. Okay, his eyes you'll see have now turned white. They used to be black. Okay, so now there's this... The city is on fire, they're screaming. A lot of stuff's happening in the background. Kind of getting the chills from watching this, jeez. Okay, what is going on? This has gotten very creepy. This has escalated a lot more than I thought. Definitely getting his 10K steps in though. I will say that's pretty admirable of him. Okay, he's speeding up now. For the first time, his pace has changed officially. Oh, he is running now. Mickey is straight sprinting, jeez. Okay, I don't know what's gonna happen next. I knew the first couple of stuff. I've, I had heard about it, but I do not know what's gonna happen next here. Oh my gosh, did he die? What? What is going on here? Oh my gosh, good thing these guys were fired. Okay, I don't ever want to watch that again in my life, so I'm glad we just experienced that together, but that is the lost media of Scary Mickey. All right, so this one's a lot lighter, literally, but back in the 90s, Subway came out with a really poor quality commercial that is basically just trying to sell their Subway sandwiches, and it's called Perfection. It was so bad that people called them out, and so they removed it from the air forever, and then, of course, the good people of Reddit ended up finding it, so this is what it looked like. Take your hunger too. Okay, I mean, that is pretty low quality. Looks like a skit that me and my friends are doing like fifth grade. This comment says it best. Imagine getting the opportunity to communicate with God and he just tells you to go to Subway. Is it just me or this guy has massive ears? He also looks like a really overweight Mr. Clean, like an Arabic Mr. Clean that gained a lot of weight. Now we're about to look at the most popular lost media to ever exist. And that is the original Shrek animation from 1995. So Chris Farley was actually supposed to play Shrek. And then of course he unfortunately passed away. So then they gave that title to Mike Myers. But 
episode prior, they actually did a little clip. It was like 40 seconds, which we're about to watch in which Chris Farley voices a small part. And you'll see that this is a drastically different animation than what you're used to. And apparently some guy found this. I don't know how people get access to this, but he was able to access like the archives of DreamWorks or something. Okay, so clearly the castle area, this looks, I mean, it's from 1995, so cut it some slack. All right, there he is. There's Shrek, what he was supposed to look like. You could see the inspiration, like the opening scene of Shrek where he's playing all-star and just doing his thing in the swamp. This was the same sort of idea. So that was Shrek before Shrek was Shrek. Before Shrek was love, before Shrek was life. Shrek was Chris Farley looking pretty disgusting. This one's one of my personal favorites, but from the episode Shanghai in SpongeBob SquarePants, the Flying Dutchman basically granted one of three characters a wish, SpongeBob, Squidward, or Patrick. And in the airing of the show, SpongeBob gets the wish. And people thought it was rigged because it's like, oh, of course SpongeBob is going to get the wish because it's his show. But somebody found some lost archives of Patrick and Squidward both separately winning and what it would look like. So we're going to watch the original version first, and then we're going to show what it looks like when Patrick and Squidward won. So it is cool that the creators actually made some separate pieces. I don't know why they never aired. I think it would be cool to like constantly air a different one. But nonetheless, we have it right here. Okay, so here's SpongeBob's wish. I wish that the Dutchman was a vegetarian. <laughs> Okay, so this is what everybody saw, the ending to the show. And then they go into the smoothie. All right, so that is the initial ending. However, here's what it looked like if Patrick or Squidward got the wish. All right, so here's Patrick's wish. All right, let's see what he chooses. Oh, no. Okay, I got it. That wish is granted. Oh, I'm sorry. Want some gum? You wish for gum. If we're gonna be here forever, we might as well have fresh breath. It's a good point. I don't think I've ever seen this before in SpongeBob of SpongeBob feeling deflated with something happening. Like I've never seen him so upset about something happening. He's usually so happy go lucky. He's kind of like with Patrick in that. So it is kind of weird seeing SpongeBob react like that. But that was Patrick's wish. So now let's see what it would look like if Squidward had the final wish. Okay, so this is if Squidward had the final wish. I wish that I had never met you two barnacle heads before in my entire life. Oh no, that's just mean. Hi there, I don't believe we met. My name is SpongeBob and this is my associate Patrick. That's not what I meant. Oh, the technicalities. And what did you say your name was? I'm Squidward, I'm your neighbor. Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, he eats them at the end? So I guess there you have it. Those are the three endings to the SpongeBob Shanghai episode. So next up is a surreal one called Short Subject, AKA Mickey Mouse in Vietnam. It was made in 1968 by Lee Savage and Milton Glaser. So it is unaffiliated with Disney, but all it is is an anti-war propaganda piece created showing Mickey Mouse going to Vietnam. And then you'll see what happens. And this apparently has tried to be scrubbed from the internet multiple times by Disney. But here we are. Kind of excited to watch this one. All right, so good old Mickey. Join the army and see the world. Let me guess he goes back. He's like, wait a second. So this is a flip book if you can't notice. So there he goes. Mickey Mouse doing some marching, ready to go to Vietnam. All right, so obviously some bad things happening there. War zone. Should Mickey Mouse enter the war zone? There's those tall grasses. And that's what happens to me, Mouse, when he goes to Vietnam. So he's getting people to not enlist in the war and to be against it. And that... Oh, okay. Maybe we shouldn't show that. A little graphic for YouTube. I wonder how many people watched this short and were like, you know what? I don't want to enlist. Like, did this actually do anything? Convert people to not enlist in the war? Maybe. The power of Disney, I guess. So Johnny Bravo, the Cartoon Network, like, jacked dude that wore the black t-shirt, he had a talk show where he would talk to the audience about Cartoon Network and other shows. And there was this clip of Johnny Bravo talking about Dragon Ball Z that for whatever reason was aired once and once only. And I guess somebody like recorded it and they uploaded it. Now we're going to watch Johnny Bravo talk about Goku, which is crazy. All right, Johnny Bravo. All right, I'm going to play your favorite episode of Dragon Ball Z, and we're going to fast forward through some of it, all right? Stay with me on this one. All right, right here, Goku is on Namek fighting that Frieza guy. Okay, okay. All right, now, okay, now back on Earth. Wow, this feels like they're definitely playing with some copyright. Johnny Bravo talking about Goku. I thought I'd never see that in my life. Yet here we are. Okay, so MTV collabed with SpongeBob, and there was a Blink-182 song in which SpongeBob SpongeBob, Patrick, Squidward, Sandy, and other characters of SpongeBob were dancing to it in the background. This was lost for a long time. I guess I could see why it's the most random thing to ever exist, but here it is. I don't know why they wanted to do this. All the small things featuring SpongeBob. So this is like a lost music video. Very fun. 
Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And that's crazy because this is YouTube kids. YouTube, you got to change the category. I've got Sandy just air humping. Speaking of weird SpongeBob collabs, and we have a SpongeBob and Target collaboration for a commercial in which they were promoting some of their lines through Target. It was made in 2001, and then it was immediately pulled off of air for whatever reason. And then, of course, people ended up finding it. So this is the commercial. Okay. It feels like Target is just leveraging existing SpongeBob footage. You know what? That was a pretty solid commercial. I kind of like that. Does, I, I wonder if they still collab if I can buy like some SpongeBob underwear from Target. So if you're a big fan of iCarly, then you probably know who Gibby is. And if you don't, then you've probably seen a meme of Gibby falling from the ceiling or something. But Gibby is a character in the show and Dan Schneider actually promised to give every character on the show a spinoff. So that's why they did Sam and Cat. That's why they had something with Freddy in the works. And he gave Gibby a show called Gibby. And for a while, people thought this was a joke and that it wasn't actually meant to ever be a show, but somebody found the pilot to the show, meaning that they actually made an entire episode around Gibby. And this is what it looks like. Why does Gibby just tower over everybody? Like, are these his peers? Also, why does he have a stain on his shirt? I feel like I would watch this show if I was like 12 years old and I was just like on Nickelodeon watching everything they put out. I mean, I wouldn't bat an eye at Gibby exclamation point. I feel like I'd have fun with this. I wonder if there's cameos from the other characters. Let's go uh, poking around. Okay, it doesn't look like it, but all of a sudden we have Gibby shirtless now, which I think is a common theme for him. All right, I think it's a good thing that this show was never aired because I don't see a reason to have like another spinoff of iCarly. I feel like we've had three at this point. I, what is Gibby even up to nowadays? Is Gibby still an actor? I hope he's doing his thing. Okay, Noah Monk and looks like he hasn't been in ever, anything for a while. Poor guy. Maybe he's just like retired from it. Oh, he makes YouTube videos. Wait. Okay, so I don't actually think he has a YouTube channel. I think I've been uh, fooled here. Next up, we have Mario Motors, which was supposed to be a sequel to the Mario DS game in the 2000s, but ultimately they scrapped it to just continue with the Mario Kart path. I mean, I see why. It's like one of the most popular games of all time. The goal of Mario Motors was to basically build your engines and so you could like kind of make the car how you'd like. So it had like a little bit of like need for speed in it, I suppose. There was never actually gameplay made by it, but here's a slide deck presented to Nintendo executives showcasing what it would have looked like. So there you have Mario and his car that he just built. There was some professor in here who's teaching people. I don't read Japanese, but maybe somebody can transcribe that. There is them putting the engine together. Here's a couple more close-up shots of it. There's the engine in more detail. Looks like 2008 this was supposed to come out. And that's it. I mean, that's the lost media. I'm kind of glad they didn't make this and go down that route. It's a little too technical. Like, I feel like a kid that's a Nintendo fan wouldn't really be picking up on that. Next up is a fun one called Super Donkey, which looks exactly like Yoshi's Island, except there's a guy who looks like Olimar and he's carrying eggs walking around. So a lot of people have theorized that it was just the beta testing for Yoshi's Island. But let's take a look at it because this one's super exciting because it could be the earliest look we have to Olimar. Okay, so there's the Olimar-like character. But then again, it doesn't really look like Yoshi's Island. It looks like an entirely different game. And this was for SNES and there's like monkeys involved. So it just doesn't, no one really knows. Like this, I guess it's a little bit Mario-y. I do firmly believe this was the beta test for Yoshi's Island. Even the boss is Bert the Bashful. It's just amazing to see how far back the graphic designs and physics go. So let's try to get to the boss. Okay, so I don't remember the Yoshi's Island bosses, but does that look like it could have been one? Wow, this game looks like a joy to play. So are you telling me they reskin this entire game, assuming this was the beta testing for Yoshi's Island? I mean, the entire concept is, is different. So I don't get like they had to basically remake the video game entirely. So next up we have Yo Gabba Gabba, the old kids show. I'm sure a lot of you guys watched it. I definitely did. It's with like those puppet characters that that guy in the orange would control. The reason this is so interesting is because the characters ended up looking a little bit different from what they looked like in the pilot. And so when this resurfaced, people were like, what? That does not look like the characters. My favorite one had to be that green monster. I don't know his name. Maybe his name is Gabba. You know, like the one with like the horns and the unibrow. Oh, there they are. Okay. Yeah, I guess they look a little bit different. Maybe. Maybe. I, I can't even tell. Like to me, to like the untrained eye, not much. Let's let's look into it a bit more. Honestly, in 20 years, people are gonna watch this and it's gonna be included in like a weird YouTube video compilation. Maybe I'll even be doing it if I'm still making videos in 20 years. And speaking of lost media kids shows, we have the pilot episode of Blue's Clues, which looks a little bit different from what you might've remembered. I remember hearing that Steve died and he became an addict. Hi out there. there he is. It's me, Steve. So look at his shirt. Have you seen Blue, my puppy? You'll notice it's not the patented green stripes. He's just wearing like a brown t-shirt. A little creepy we without the music. So glad you're here today. Can you help me today? Yes. What did you say? Yes. Yes. Let me help you find blue. Blue, blue, blue. Stop. Blue, blue, blue. Blue, blue, blue. Blue, blue, blue. blue, blue, blue.
We found him. Okay, that's enough of that. This one's a little bit uncanny, but it's called King Koopa's Cool Cartoons. And it was a live action show where somebody dressed up as Bowser and talked to kids and answered their questions. I'm sure pretty quickly you could see why this was pulled off of air and why nobody has really seen it since right now. There's the kids, potato quality and everything. Very grainy. Koopa. Okay, this is before Bowser was Bowser. Ooh, he looks more like Yoshi than Bowser. Very funny, Bowser. Why are they trying to make Bowser like some slapstick character? Bowser is supposed to be like this evil beast that's just like wants to steal Mario's girl. This is not what Bowser should be like. I feel like they really dropped the ball on like making Bowser Bowser. The next piece of lost media is a popular one from the show Jimmy Kimmel in which for Valentine's Day, Snoopy asked Tiger Woods for dating advice in light of everything that happened with Tiger Woods in which he cheated on his wife and like rammed his golf cart into a tree, I think. I believe this was pulled off of air by ABC after kind of realizing that it was kind of distasteful, but luckily for you guys, we got it. Wow, he looked a lot different back then. This is what Tiger Woods was actually typing his text messages. Send me something very naughty. Go to the bathroom and take a picture. <laughs> Snoopy! <laughs> Okay, I, that was actually kind of funny. I feel like that's the funniest Jimmy Kimmel has been in 13 years. This next piece of lost media is one of my favorites. It's called How the Hamster Saved Winter, and it's a 25 minute short film based on the character Hampton, who's that iconic hamster dancing meme. It really has like a plot and everything, but it's actually the worst movie ever created as well. So it doubles as being a piece of lost media, the worst movie to ever exist. And I guess it triples because it also has to do with the memes. That's kind of cool. And here we have it, made in 2009. There's Hampton. So the plot of this movie is that they're trying to save Christmas. Or I guess winter. Tools, accessories, options, opportunities, all those items that help save the day. Why does he sound like Rocket from Guardians of the Galaxy? Hampton, you did it. Here's the outro to the movie. That's the conclusion. Voila. Wow, why was that actually a really good movie? I highly recommend watching this. How the Hamster Saved Winter. Back in the early 2000s, Playhouse Disney invented a character in a show called Stanley, which just chronicles this young boy just basically like talking to animals and like learning how to do things. Nobody really knew what the pilot looked like, but the pilot has officially been released as of a couple of years ago. So this is what it looks like. I'm sure a lot of you guys will remember Stanley, but if not, here's your introduction to him. There's good old Stanny. You'll see that they wasted no frames here. Very Jungle Book-esque. But who is it actually? Stanley. Why does that goldfish look familiar? Say, did you know kangaroos can jump 10 feet straight up in the air? Why do they need to make the guy who gives facts British? I feel like it's so condescending. You're just making the smartest animal British. It's lazy. It's lazy Playhouse Disney. All right, just so you guys can see what the show actually looks like, it's not all like that. So you see they actually increase their production value and the animation's more fluid. Next up, we have Blue Sango, which is a Japanese PC adventure game from 1997 that has been lost for a very long time. And then people found this and they were going bizarre. Zerk. Like, this is probably one of the most popular lost media pieces founded over the last 15 years. It's just your classic point and click puzzle based adventure game. Nothing super crazy about it, but if you do want to see some footage, you're in luck because we have it right here. So, here you are, just full scrolling 360 capability, and you just move by scrolling and clicking where you want to go. These were the best games where you could just like click and get to a certain point. Now you just use your arrow keys and you just move too freely. We need a little bit of restriction in games because you have to define what the goal is. If you keep things too open-ended, I feel like it kind of ruins things. Oh my gosh, I just click forward and all of a sudden the kangaroo's baby's drowning. The Joey's drowning. What are you scrolling around for? How could you go to sleep at night? Oh, oh, there we go. All right, that got intense out of nowhere. So that's Blue Sango. I feel like I kind of want to play that game full through, but it has been found. So I think you actually could play it if you want. Next up is an iconic piece of lost media that people were looking for forever. And ultimately some Reddit user, of course, found it. And that is the Wicked Witch from the Wizard of Oz appeared on Sesame Street in 1976, but then it was ultimately pulled off of air because it was too scary for children. And guess what? 40 years later, we found it. But here's what it looks like. Let's see how scary this is. I think it's the original actress reprised her as well. So far, not super scary. I'll be back. Okay, pretty good CGI back then. And then I believe she reappears. And I think this is the scene in which it's actually too scary for kids. Abierto, I think that means open in Spanish. I guess that means close. All right, let me guess, Oscar comes out. Oh, wow. I wonder what she's gonna turn into. Oh, it's Dorothy. Oh no, 
went to the now I'll go into the store and see if I can get my broom. Oh, she seems like such a sweet old lady. Why does she play the witch? Yeah, so that's the appearance of the Wicked Witch on Sesame Street. You can't find this anywhere but this YouTube video that exists right here. It's gone forever though otherwise, but somebody uncovered it, so good on them. Here's something that I don't think needs a lot of explanation, but it is lost media. It's the Holy Bible Game Boy Advance game that almost existed. So this is uh, an unreleased game. This is what it looked like, the gameplay of it. Licensed by Nintendo, you'll see Crave Entertainment actually made this in 2006. The Holy Bible. So here's the gameplay of this. And you may be thinking, what's the game? Well, the game is just you could toggle through things and you could just like quickly navigate to chapters and stuff. So yeah, see, you can go up and down to see different verses, you could bookmark. So it was more of like an interactive Bible than an actual game. But I still think it's amazing that there could be like a kid in the back of a car on his Game Boy Advance and he's just like reading the Bible. That's very wholesome. This next one feels illegal to look at because it seems to be too behind the scenes, but it's Burger King's training videos back in the 90s. This was only sent to a couple of locations to train their employees was ultimately pulled for no reason whatsoever. I don't know how somebody got their hands on this, but we're going to be looking at Burger King's training videos from the 90s that only a few people have seen. Remember the old Burger King outside? Burger King used to rule the game when they had those crowns sitting on the corner. You could like put them on your head while you eat your Whopper. So you not only impact the success of your restaurant, but the success of the entire Burger King system. Wow, what a sell. They're basically saying that Burger King, the success is contingent on you. Like, which I guess is a pretty good motto if you want to like excite your employees, but that's a lot of pressure on them. That's why it's important you approach your new job with an understanding that excellent guest service is behind everything we do. Okay, but what are you paying your workers? Who do you think the least valuable worker in a fast food restaurant is? I would say the least valuable, it might be the cashiers because they've already begun replacing those with like those robots at the front where you could just like do the touch screen. So I think that that's the businesses themselves saying cashiers are kind of useless. Your most important job is to provide such exceptional service. I've not once had somebody come and take my tray at a Burger King. My dream is to own a fast food restaurant, just be like a franchisee. When and where your schedule yes, will there's be a schedule. Do people still clock in and clock out of fast food restaurants? If you guys work there, can you let me know like what you do when you get there? Do you just say, oh, I'm here, and then you're salaried in a sense, or do you have to actually clock in, clock out? Is it like an honor system? Great. Use a nail brush to completely clean your fingernails. There is no shot that workers at a fast food restaurant are using a nail brush to clean their fingernails. I don't even think, and this is disgusting, that a majority of people wash their hands. There have been studies on this, like only 40% of people actually thoroughly wash their hands after using the bathroom. If you're watching this and you don't do it, you have to do it, that's disgusting. But just think, they're handling your food. Ugh, the food's already questionable. It's just made of like toxins and stuff. And then you're gonna add in your own toxins. That's so nasty. But I'm glad that they're at least teaching people to do like extra steps. So then people will be like, oh, I'm not gonna use the nail brush. I'll just wash my hands. And at least they're washing their hands. Wow, what a powerful, powerful training video we just watched. I feel riled up, ready to go. I wanna work at a Burger King and just start slinging patties, getting those sales in. So in November of 1983, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood launched a five episode arc called Mr. Rogers Talks About Conflict. It was in response to a film called The Day After from ABC, which actually scarred a lot of kids because it showed nuclear fallout in the Midwest. It basically portrayed like this massive bomb being dropped. Kids were obviously like super upset and like traumatized by it. And so Mr. Rogers Rogers decided to come in, save the day, and teach them about conflict and the realities of it. So you can see here, he's actually getting out a disc called The Food Drop, in which he shows people like how rescue efforts happen for people who are disturbed in certain areas. There's a plane dropping off some food. And then he goes on to talk to these puppets, in which he talks about conflict and how to best avoid it, or if you do find yourself in it, how to you know, optimize for it. I'm not sure why they took this off air. I feel like this is pretty useful to people. Here's a piece of lost media called Rayman's Training. So in Rayman 2, there was something called Rayman's Training that nobody actually knew what it was about. And people were convinced that it didn't exist for the longest time until this happened. So we can actually see Rayman training and fighting this guy. Bam, punches him over. Here's his training arc. I don't know if this is a cutscene. I'm not really super familiar with the Rayman games. Wow. So this is his training arc. I'm glad we saw this because it makes more sense how he became like a killer assassin. Yep, and then he did him in and that's the end of Rayman's training. All right, guys, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more content, make sure to click here or click here. Otherwise, subscribe on your way out and I'll see you next time. Peace.